All right, um, let's pray. Lord, we're going to uh, continue St. Paul's journey. He'll go to Corinth, um, very important stop for him, uh, where he spent a good number of, a good amount of time. And um, so keep us uh, aware of this great work. He, he goes to, it's a very tough city. It's kind of the, you know, it was uh, known for its immorality and uh, for its wealth and opulence and all those things. So um, help us to know that Paul's going to a difficult assignment. And um, sometimes in our life, we have difficult assignments. Uh, people we know and love are trying to convert. So keep us faithful like Paul was and um, help us to, uh, to rejoice in whatever work you give us to do through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Now, I want to... Uh, remind you of um, where we've been. I want to bring up the map first of all. So let me look there. Well, that's actually not the one I wanted, the other map. Uh, yeah, all right. So if I can share the screen, bring this up. Okay, good. Now, uh, this is again uh, how Paul began the journey from Antioch. And they went through Tarsus and back through those towns they had evangelized on their first missionary journey. Wanted to go this way over to Cappadocia, but they were prevented. So they came this way to Troas, came over then into Philippi. And uh, their first convert there was Lydia and her family. They then came down into Thessalonica, um, which um, is down in this region right here. And uh, they had, uh, unfortunately, some um, ne'er near do wells kind of made it difficult for them there. And they had to leave a little early where Paul hadn't fully finished his, if you will, catechesis for the people. And he would later have to write some corrective letters um, that kind of clear up some mistakes that they, mistaken impressions they had that the Lord was going to come very soon. So they, they, they flee to Berea. They, they, are, they, are, they, they went to Berea and they found the people there much more accepting um, of an understanding of the scriptures for some reason. They, maybe the synagogue just trained them better there. We don't know. Uh, but they found them very good and accepting of the scriptures and were very excited. It's interesting, there's no letter to the Bereans, you know, and all of his the letters that we have that, that, that have survived. So um, he did write to the Thessalonians, who he got a lot of trouble from, and from the Philippians, who ran him out of town. Um, but he didn't write to the Bereans. It's interesting. Anyway, he goes down briefly then. They, they say, you got to get the heck out of Dodge after they came from Thessalonica and ran him out of Berea. So he went down to Athens for a brief stay, did a little bit of preaching but at the Areopagus, but not to great effect. And now we're going to see that he goes over to Corinth. Um, and this is going to be uh, an important stay for him. Now, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about Corinth before we get into the text. Um, let me bring up my stop sharing this thing um, and see if I can share another screen. Um, I think, um, where is my uh, video here? Yeah. Um, let me see if I'm able to share this screen. Um, hang on, I'm sorry. I'm just getting used to some of this. Um, now it's going to play with me. Here we go. Drink it. Okay. See if I can share that screen video. Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you a little video that sort of depicts Corinth as it would have looked at the time of Paul. Um, and I'll uh, um, just kind of run the video and I'll tell you a little bit about the city of Corinth as the video runs. Okay. So let me play that for you. Okay. So we're going into Corinth here. You can see like any ancient city, it had walls. Usually there was a high area above it that was like a fort where they could see enemies and things like that. Um, so Corinth was, a, um, uh, was made for greatness. It's, it was in a narrow little isthmus. Everybody had to go through Corinth, who was going from northern Greece to southern Greece. And um, um, it, um, it was a beautiful city. As you can see, it had theaters. It had um, a hippodrome, you know, where the horse races were run. Uh, it had uh, an amphitheater, an amphitheater um, uh, great markets. Um, the, the city was laid out um, in a beautiful fashion. Uh, you see, like right now down here, you can all see this, right? See the market down there? It, right now, it's not very populated. You'll see another market later. Um, but you see that um, um, off in the distance is the, uh, is the Colosseum or the amphitheater. Um, 
we have temples and government buildings. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. This would be, pardon the expression, but it's the poorer side of town, but there it is. And um, again, theaters, a smaller one and a greater one. Um, and uh, let's see, what else is there worth um, showing you? They're, they're going to, they're sort of showing the top of the city. They're going to kind of go down into the city now. Um, and you start to see again, these rather beautiful um, streets, many fountains and statues. Uh, Corinth was a great and a beautiful city, much like Washington, you know, today. Uh, the beautiful Corinthian columns and um, lots of beautiful um, marketplaces and colonnaded walkways like this one here. You see the beautiful colonnades and uh, usually inside those there would be markets going on and uh, beautiful statuary. Corinth is in ruins today. I've walked among these ruins. Um, and so we see, see way up high there, there's a temple, but also a military gar garrison up there at the top of the mountain overlooking the city. And this would be the kind of the government center that you were just looking at there. This would be like an open fora or marketplace. Right now, nobody's in there, but we'll see in a, a marketplace soon. This is an example of the house of one of the rich people they would have these open courtyards in the middle of their house. This is the Hippodrome, the, the horse racing track. And um, you can see all the people sort of in the stands. It's hard to see them, but uh, they're getting ready to start a horse race. Um, so um, now over here on the left, you'll see there's a marketplace that is up and running. Um, let's just wait till we swing around and see that. <clears throat> It was kind of a vanity fair of the ancient world. Now this is a theater and uh, the large theater of two, two that were there. And you see the actors on the stage down there. The Greek word for actor is hypocritos or hypocrite. So there's one of the markets and where people are set up, the tents are set up. It's just outside the, the, uh, the theater. And um, well, this is, um, uh, they're actually having here, this is the amphitheater. They're actually having here probably a uh, gladiatorial contest. <clears throat> so I think you get the gist of it. I don't want to run the whole video. It goes on, I think, for about another, um, well, just another one minute, two, less than two minutes. We'll let it run. Those are the beautiful olive trees that are all over Greece. Oh, my goodness. Greece is just everywhere. Olive trees just grow like weeds. Now you see the horse race going on there in the, in the Hippodrome and a little bit of rain falling for the afternoon. Okay, this is the, you know, the kind of the nicer, wealthier side of town. You can kind of see it's laid out. Beautiful homes, um, very beautiful um, uh, city. This whole road here that you're going up is, is today in ruins. And I walked up and up and down that road. We have the temple here. This temple that we're coming right by now, flying by now on the right center, is the ruins are still there today in Corinth of that particular temple. You see all the watchtowers on the walls too. You know, every night, you know, they, they were they were serious about you know shutting the gates and making sure enemies didn't get get access to the city. It was a different world then. You know, there wasn't a lot of law outside the city walls. You're on your own. I deprived you of all the beautiful music. I don't know if you can hear it now. Okay, so there, there's basically Corinth, yeah. So I just wanted you to get a sense of it. It's a huge, not, it wasn't a huge city like, like we think of today with millions of people, but it, um, it, it was a, um, a beautiful city. It was a large city for the time. And um, so yes, we're, um, we're gonna admit John to the meeting here, okay. So just so I get, now let me show you another little slide here, just so you can see more clearly why Corinth was such a wealthy uh, and well-known city. If I can bring this up, hmm, I better put his um, mute on, huh? Mute, okay. Um, if I can show you this, let me share this screen. Um, 
Now you see there, there, there's Athens and then there's Corinth. And notice between the northern part of uh, Greece and the southern part called Achaia, there's a very narrow isthmus there, just about nine or 10 miles wide. And you, you just can't go uh, anywhere from north to south unless you go through Corinth. So <laughs> think, of, think of toll booths, think of um, tax stations, think of um, mark, open markets and uh, uh, great, great, uh, you know, great wealth. Everybody had to go through that little narrow, that little narrow place there you know, that I'm pointing to now with my arrow. Uh, Corinth is just, it was a charmed city. It's sitting right where you wanna, you're gonna get, you're, you just can't help but make money, amen? So you see the vision, right? Okay, so it means that really everybody came through here, both the good and the bad. So uh, Corinth had the reputation of being um, a very immoral town. In fact, if you wanted to uh, refer to a, uh, a woman as, uh, as having less, shall we say, being less than virtuous, you'd call her a Corinthian girl. Uh, so this was a, um, so it gives you a little bit of an idea of how the town uh, was regarded. And um, so it's a tough, a tough assignment Paul is about to take up here. All right, good. Now we'll, um, we'll go to a little bit of the text itself. Um, let me just see if there's anything else I want to tell you about Corinth. Um, it was subject to a lot of earthquakes and, and you say, well, how was the city destroyed today? Uh, it was destroyed again by a series of earthquakes. Um, the region is known for a lot of earthquakes and things. So, um, yeah. Now it says here, Paul stayed longer in Corinth than any other city with the single exception of Ephesus where he was there for almost three years in Ephesus. So he's here um, in, in Corinth for a little over two years. And uh, so this is not a brief stay. He's gonna be there and he's gonna spend a lot of time setting this church up, okay? Um, so we're going to find out that, uh, let's see, it was about 55 AD when he arrived and um, um, things were not all that well in Corinth. Um, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, okay? So with that in mind, we're in, we're in Acts chapter 18, if you wanna get your Bibles out. And um, I'll just read the first few verses and then maybe I'll get one of you to help me, okay? All right, with that in mind, so Acts 18 and verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews must leave Rome. And so he went to see them. And because he was in the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. They were tent makers uh, by trade. Uh, he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So again, uh, Paul had been somehow connected with Aquila and Pris Priscilla, and he, um, uh, they had, you know, in a way, had done some work already in the area of Corinth. And again, they, they were drawn together pretty easily because of their similar trade, namely tent making. Um, and um, um, let's see. Um, We'll go on from there. I don't have much more to say about those opening lines, but why don't we um, uh, go ahead and see what happens. Um, would someone like to read tonight? Hmm? All right, go ahead, Kate. And I think you're going to help me here. So start with verse five and I'll tell you when to stop. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, your blood be on your own hands. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius, Titius Justus a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Okay, just stop there for a minute. Again, um, um, you know, again, he, he was uh, testifying in the synagogue, trying to show them that Jesus was the Messiah for whom they were waiting. And maybe a few would have heard him, but most rejected him. He was reviled, it says there. So again, he shakes the dust, you know, a very Jewish thing. <laughs> Shake the dust, like rending garments and, and things like this. So um, it's, it's his way of saying, look, you know, again, I'll go to the Gentiles um, and make you jealous. But uh, at the end of the day, um, he goes to stay in the house of Titius Justice, the worshiper of God. Now, we talked about this expression before 
a quote, worshiper of God, uh, sometimes the, the Greek word proselyte is used. This would refer to Greeks or, you know, Gentiles, Greek, Greek speaking Gentiles, who were um, admiring of the Jewish faith and the um, order and uh, in, in Jewish communities. Most of the Greek, Roman and Greek communities of this time were sort of um, what we're struggling with today. There was a lot of crime, disorder, families were falling apart, young men were kind of wild and um, uh, girls were getting pregnant. There was a lot of abortion and exposure of infants. Um, life was uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty fallen apart. We're, we're talking here about, we're not at the heyday of the Roman Empire by any means. Um, and again, they've fallen into great immorality and a kind of a spiritual laziness. When you have 60% of your population who are slaves, doting and serving on 40% who live the life of Riley, there's great immorality and great laziness and sloth. Um, things are falling to pieces. So a lot of uh, Gentiles, not a lot, but let's just say a certain number of Gentiles began to admire the order in Jewish communities where they didn't seem to be affected by all of this or infected by all of this, um, uh, this uh, hedonism, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, immorality that pervaded the latter part of the Roman Empire. Um, and so they, they, called, they were sometimes called proselytes or uh, fearers of God or worshipers of God. They couldn't officially become Jews because you had to be born into the Jewish community, but they were kind of considered um, friends of the Jewish community. And they were sometimes allowed to listen in through the synagogue doors um, and uh, or the windows and, and so on. So we see here that the, among them, uh, Paul was, be, was befriended by one of them, these worshipers of God, um, Titus, Titus Justus, the worshiper of God. His house was very ne right next door to the synagogue. <laughs> Little chutzpah there, right? Okay, I'm leaving the synagogue. I'm moving next door. <laughs> and I'm going to conduct business from right next door. So that's very, uh, that's very interesting. Why don't you continue now, uh, okay, with the um, um, verse 8. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord, together with all his household. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. One night, the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on, on you to harm you. For there are many in this city who are my people. He stayed there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Okay, so I misspoke earlier when I said he was there two years, but you know, a year and a half. Now, it, 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 this is a very truncated description of what takes place here. We do see that some of the Jews uh, do convert, even, even the synagogue leader, uh, but his main, his main um, group is among the Gentiles, where he brings a great number of converts. Um, some work had already been done in Corinth before he ever got there. And the Lord is saying, you know, look, he says, don't be afraid, but go on speaking. Don't be silent. He's like, uh, Lord, is trouble looming? Is there something I should know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when someone comes to reassure you, don't worry about what they're saying about you out there. Like, oh, what are they saying? So that happened to me a few weeks ago. You know, um, uh, Monsignor, don't worry about what they're saying about you out there. <laughs> what are they saying about me out there? You know, the Washington Post kind of published that hit piece, you know. And uh, <laughs> I'm lying flat on my back. I can hardly breathe and talk. And they're, they're, I'm getting these calls. Don't worry, Father. We'll 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 defend you. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I can kind of uh, relate to Paul here. As the Lord is reassuring him, don't be afraid uh, to testify. Uh, I wasn't Lord. Is something I need to know. Uh, um, don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Don't be silent. For I'm with you. No one will attack you or harm you. Um, okay. And um, and he stayed there. Now. Uh, we do see, though, that again, there are um, there are there are attacks, and there are people who seek seek to trouble him. So let's read on to the end, uh, to the uh, until uh, we'll start with twelve and go through seventeen, if you could. So, but when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. They said, 
This man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of crime or serious villainy, I would be justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I do not wish to be a judge on these matters. He dismissed them from the tribunal. Then all of them seized Sosthenes, the official of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of these things. So <laughs> that's what they get for bringing up these charges against Paul. The, uh, the proconsul Gallio is not um, uh, impressed with the charges. He says, this is a, your own matter, take care of it. So then the, the, the Jews who um, had followed apparently the lead of Sosthenes turned on him and beat him. Uh, you see, you start to see the character of some of these folks, right? Um, and um, some of them are just looking for a fight. And it's interesting that Gallio doesn't do anything about it. He basically just lets these Jews beat up on each other. You know, if your enemy is killing himself, why, uh, I mean, you know, destroying himself, don't interfere. Uh, it's kind of the notion there. Um, the, you know, the, the, the Roman officials tried to keep good order and to be just and fair. But frankly, they didn't like the Jews and the Jews didn't like them. So the reason he doesn't intervene is that he says, well, I mean, if my enemy's, you know, you know, stabbing himself in the foot and doing all kinds of things to harm himself, why should I interfere, right? So he, he lets them fight on. Okay, now, um, let's uh, go on and read um, some more, uh, verse 18 through 21. After staying there for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Chentrea, Chentrea, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but first he himself went in, into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. Then he sailed from Ephesus. Okay, I want to take the map out of here again. All right. So as I say, uh, it's, a, it's remarkable that he spent a year and a half and so little ink is spilled on the stay. We have a lot more ink spilled on places where he wasn't nearly as long, like uh, Athens and Philippi and uh, Thessalonica. So it's interesting here that um, Luke, maybe because he wasn't there uh, for an extended period, um, says little about this at this time. So let me see if I can share the screen here. Again, of this... Um, map. So here he is over here in Corinth. Uh, and then they, they come over here to, uh, to the port um, um, at Senecre. Um, and then they sail across the uh, Aegean Sea to Ephesus. Now I, by the way, um, am a veteran, uh, as, as uh, some of our parishioners here are, of having sailed the Aegean Sea. Uh, we started out in Athens uh, down here, and we went across all the way uh, over to uh, Ephesus from, from there. And then we went all the way down to Crete. Oh, I'm sorry, we stopped at Patmos. And then we went all the way down to Crete and we, we saw some, some, some things there. And then we sailed all the way back up to Athens. That was a three day cruise on the, Medi on the Aegean Sea. And it's got, as you can see, lots of islands associated with it. And um, it's a, um, uh, it was a beautiful cruise, um, tiny little cabins, but they figure you're not going to stay much in your cabin except to sleep. <laughs> but it was a nice, it was a nice, it was my first time ever going on any kind of a cruise. And gosh, nothing's happening now, right? I mean, we did it just in time, you know. But anyway, all that's to say, but notice again, going back to Paul, he went uh, right across from, from Senecre, which is the port city at, at near Corinth, and he went all the way across the Aegean to Ephesus. Now, it says here something very interesting. He shaved his head for he had taken a vow. This is what's called a Nazarite vow. Um, what, he's, what he's going to do, he, he's preparing to go for the Feast of Pentecost down to Jerusalem. You know, as I told you earlier in one of our sessions, Paul, although he was, was um, very angry at the Judaizers who insisted that people needed to live a Jewish life uh, under the Jewish laws and customs to be saved, 
Um, he was very, very offended by that. Uh, he said, no, we're saved by Jesus, not by wearing certain clothes or eating certain foods. Um, uh, he was offended, but that doesn't mean that he himself hated his Jewish culture. So what we see here is that uh, he's now uh, in, engaged in something called a Nazarite vow, and they would let their hair grow a little bit like Samson, um, and um, that these, they would fast and they would stay away from strong wine and uh, all these kinds of things uh, were part of this. And it was a Jewish practice. And St. Paul, although he railed against others being required to do so, did not himself. And his preparation for the great feast of Pentecost that he wanted to go to in Jerusalem that year, he, um, he did this. He undertook this vow. Okay. And if you want to study more about it, rather than go through lots of details with you here, you can look up the word Nazarite vow. It's not related to the town name for Nazareth directly, although it um, um, uh, it sounds a lot alike. It's, uh, it, it has nothing to do per, per se with the town of Nazareth, but the Nazarites were those who, um, it, it, it's the Hebrew root word is branch. Uh, but all I could say is branch means like a division or a group. So, um, um, this was a group of people who, have, have any of you heard of this Exodus 90 thing that some of these men are doing lately? It's something like that, you know, but it was more longstanding in, in Jewish tradition. This Exodus 90 group is something rather new um, in, our, in our time. Okay, so notice again, he's here in, uh, he comes across to, from Seneca uh, to Ephesus. Now, he's not gonna spend much time in Ephesus now, um, he's going to come back to Ephesus on the third missionary journey and spend almost three years there. Okay. But for now, he just kind of goes there briefly as we will see. I think I'll um, go ahead and take the map down, but you see where we've done, what we've done. We've kind of almost come full circle. We're back into Turkey here. And then Paul's about to sail right on down into Caesarea and down into Jerusalem. So let's go ahead. I'm going to take the map down and um, let you go ahead and continue reading. When he had landed at, at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Um, could you go back to 18 and read, read 18 through uh, 21 again? Yes. After staying there for a considerable amount of time, Paul said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria accompanied by Priscilla and, Aqu and Aquila. At Chenecre, he had his hair cut for he was under a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there. But first he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they had asked him to stay longer, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. Okay, I just wanted to repeat that last part. So there's really very little we know about his first uh, time in Ephesus, except that he did a little bit of work in the synagogue. That's really all we know. Okay, now let's continue on. I'm sorry. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from place to place through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Okay, hmm, let's see here. Down there. Okay, good. Now let me, um, um, we'll bring up the map and again, but let me just tell you a little bit about, I'm gonna bring up the map. Um, let me just try to do that again. Okay, good. Now you can see that uh, it's quite a long, uh, several weeks there probably to get, to get from Ephesus, you know, down through, uh, all the way down to Caesarea. Now, Caesarea is a very interesting town. It's in ruins today, like so many other things. Um, it was built by uh, Herod uh, just out of nowhere. It was, a, just a, it was just a beach. And he wanted a port, but there was no natural port along the Mediterranean there uh, in what we call today the Holy Land. So he went ahead and just built a port. What he did was, um, he was, um, I don't know if you know, Herod the Great was a wicked, evil man, but he was a great architect. Uh, and uh, he ushered in a lot of architectural things that, have, that are still with us today, including what we call concrete, but particularly concrete that can set underwater. So you pour the concrete into this big mold, 
um, and it starts to set and you sink it and it continues to harden even underwater. Uh, he just, you know, he and his um, architects of his time discovered this. And so what they did literally is they built out a, um, um, they built out a kind of a, a big walled area that, that, that became a, uh, an artificial port so that ships or boats could come inside these, these large walls that they built and be in effect in a harbor, a place of safety from, from the winds or storms and unload their things and, uh, and so on. And you can still see ruins of that great wall today and ruins of the great theater and the uh, aqueduct. And it was, it was a great city he built just in the middle of nowhere and turn it into a port city. And so in Paul's time, in the time of Jesus, Caesarea was a great port city uh, that, that basically served all of this area. I'm gonna see if I can find a picture and I can put up for you because it's quite, it's quite uh, an amazing thing. Um, ancient Caesarea. All right, let me just see if I go, that's not, okay, there we go. Some images. Uh, if I can find, yeah, here's a fairly good picture of what ancient Caesarea would have looked like. Let me see if I can get this to show up for you. Hang on. Hmm, why is that not? Well, let me try to share this. Am I sharing the screen? Do you see this? No. Okay, stop sharing one. Let me go back to this. Come on. Well, it's playing with me. Um, hmm. Try this. Try, try, try. I don't want to. I don't want to keep you forever. Let me try one more time to bring this up. Um, open image. Copy the image. Um, save image. Here we go. Save image. Sorry, don't mean to keep you waiting. I got the little beach ball spinning. Okay. Okay. Now, let me just try to go get it off my desktop and share it with you. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, here we are. All right. Ah, uh, well, it's not very big, but I'll give it a try. All right. So um, now I'm coming back to you all. And I will try to share that. <clears throat> okay. Kind of hard to see. Um, can you see those walls going out there? That's the artificial port. Do you see what I'm pointing to there? Okay. And you can see that there's a big, uh, there's a big temple. There's a theater. That's still there today. It's in ruins. You can sit there and in the steps in the theater. And uh, there's a jail where Paul was kept over this way. And so the, the, there's this ancient port, and it was just basically there. And there's a great aqueduct that would come that came through here to fill it with water. So all of this was uh, arranged by Caesar out of nothing. He just built out in a no place place along the beach. Okay, so I think that's about the best I can do. Sorry. All right. So now Paul is moving to, into um, going down into. He's come to Caesarea. And now he moves down the way, strengthens some of the people along the way. But at the end of the day, his destination is Jerusalem, where he wants to be there for the great uh, feast of, uh, of Pentecost. Um, so let's see here. Um, our, 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 yeah, our text goes back. I'm sorry. To, I, 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 um, our text uh, goes back here. Um, to a um, another, uh, so go ahead and pick up at verse 24. We, uh, although Paul's on his way down to Jerusalem, we don't follow him there. Our, our attention turns back to Ephesus for a moment. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew, he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. 
On his arrival, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had become believers. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. Okay, good. Uh, so what I want to do here is uh, that we see here uh, that a, a gifted preacher named Apollos is, um, is, a, um, is, is preaching well and effectively. However, um, um, he, um, he didn't know properly of the baptism of Jesus, but only of that of Paul. Now, what we're dealing with here is um, a man who, again, has some knowledge but uh, has errors. Now, this leads us then to an important problem in the church. And uh, what we do well in some years, we don't do so well in other years. So with the, uh, what I would just say is that um, what I'm talking about is that the church should be self-correcting. But the sad fact is that very often we are not. Um, Let's take a, a maybe a, this is a very good scenario. So there, uh, someone is found to be preaching about Christ, but there are inaccuracies. And so two members of the church, of Priscilla and Aquila, take him aside and they correct him and they teach him. And uh, now he's able to preach even more effectively and accurately. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he is able to, again, not just spread the word there, but also to go across to Achaia. Um, now, um, so this is a good man who just needed to be corrected. Now, in, in the church, though, there are some other, um, uh, there are some other problems that we have, uh, not just that there are certain people who, uh, through ignorance, you know, just preach the wrong thing. They just don't know any better. They're just saying something that's not correct. That's, we, it's one thing to correct them, but we also need in the church to correct those who willfully go out and preach and teach error. And um, in, 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 in certain times of the church, there, there we were very strong about refuting these, these, the errors of, uh, of heretics. Now, there's two ways to be a heretic, a formal heretic or a material heretic. A formal heretic is one who knows it's wrong and says, to heck with the actual teaching, I'm going to teach something different. That's a formal heretic. A material heretic is someone who is saying the wrong thing or teaching the wrong thing, but they're not doing it intentionally. They're just doing it out of some either uh, some ignorance, either general ignorance or a specific ignorance about a certain fact. And to some degree, we're all material heretics. There's, there's just some things that we don't understand properly. And we, we come to see, oh, oh, I've never, I, I didn't know I was, I was wrong in what I thought about that. So anyway, that's... Um, now, in, in better days, the church has been able to take those who were erroneously preaching and ask them to correct, and sometimes they would do that. Um, other times, they would, um, um, if you will, um, they would, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they would re reject the church, and then the church would either excommunicate them or declare them to be heretics or at least give a warning to God's people that this particular person is not teaching according to the, um, according to the way that the church understands. Um, so uh, today, unfortunately, we know that there are some many, many priests and people who are allowed to go around teaching error. Now, among them would be, I would say, first and foremost, uh, James Martin, um, who is teaching erroneously because he doesn't while he preaches that we should be respectful of people with same-sex attraction, and that is correct, he doesn't teach them properly that they are supposed to live celibately and uh, that they're, if they're not called to marriage, traditional marriage, then like anybody else who doesn't attain to traditional marriage, they're not to engage in sexual relations, and he just doesn't say that. And um, this, is, this is therefore a kind of a heresy by silence. So, at any rate, all that's a way of saying that um, um, we have this, uh, this picture of today in the church where a lot of people are allowed to say a lot of crazy things and are not being corrected. See? So, um, ideally, our bishops should discipline priests who speak erroneously, and um, they, they, they ought to be doing that regularly when, when either priests or deacons or or others are acting, and then we get also to the moral life of the church. Here too, we have an awful lot, unfortunately, an awful lot of um, uh, 
things that have gone uncorrected. And we know that through the sexual abuse scandals, um, through other misbehavior by priests and uh, where bishops have not corrected them, they have not corrected each other. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, of things that have been where, where people winked, winked at faults and, and uh, didn't take seriously uh, when the lay faithful would say this, this priest is abusing my son or daughter. Um, these things were, were not dealt with uh, or they were not dealt with well enough. Um, if any priest starts acting out like that, he needs to go away. Uh, they were, you know, just moving them around. You know the whole story. I don't need to repeat it. But these are examples of the, the fact that the church should be self-correcting, self-correcting. Um, we have a, um, a serious, I think, problem in that today, um, a real lack of leadership. Now, we also see today that um, also uncorrected are many people. Now, what happens is these political leaders become widely known for their views, you know, I'm Catholic, but, and, you know, um, I support abortion rights, or I support physician assisted suicide or gay marriage or whatever. And of course, it's, a, it's just, it's just a, uh, a, a, what do you call it? A, um, a thankless task for bishops to try to correct politicians. But I think what the bishops should do about this matter is, is not to target just politicians because there's probably a lot of Catholics who do not, who have dissented significantly from church views that probably should be um, reminded that what Holy Communion involves is not just receiving, you know, pardon the expression, the wafer um, or, or just engaging in some ritual. But what, what you say when you go in the, in the priest or the deacon, whoever says the body of Christ, and you say amen, what you're saying is, the full meaning of that amen is, I believe all that the Holy Catholic Church believes, teaches, and professes to be revealed by God. I am in communion with the Lord and his body, the church. And so I accept all that the church believes, teaches, and professes to be revealed by God. That's, by the way, when a person is brought into full communion with the church, say a Protestant who's already baptized, that's the formula they recite. See? Now, this, of course, leads to to the conclusion that there's probably a good number of Catholics who might need to refrain from going to communion for several reasons. One, maybe they're, they're in mortal sin and they haven't been to confession, you see? Or they're, um, uh, you know, they're not able to get to confession right now because they're either in an invalid marriage or they reject some aspect of the, uh, of the church's teachings, uh, very significant aspects, not just uh, a minor thing, but, um, um, now, I, I, what I find with Catholics who come to me sometimes is that I don't want to simply turn a difficulty into a doubt. So sometimes they just, they're struggling with the church's teachings on life or on homosexuality. Uh, and maybe just to sit down and try to show them the background and explain and put all the pieces together and build a foundation and put up the wall so that they can they can see why the church teaches this. And even if they struggle to live it perfectly, they can at least say, well, I see the truth there and we can restore them to communion. So it doesn't simply follow that if you have any disagreement with church teachings or any doubts, for example, I get a lot of people that say, look, I, I know my, my neighbors are two homosexual men, the nicest guys in the world. I just don't think they're going to go to hell. You know, we say, well, first of all, that's a simplistic understanding of the church's teaching. Why don't you and I sit down and talk about it, you know, so that, you know, you're not just, you know, brushing aside the church teaching, but your understanding um, of why the church teaches this and what, you know, and maybe, and then I can usually find I can work with people, see? So we want to be careful because we don't want to simply push people out of the church, but it is important to say that when you come to Holy Communion, that you are uh, in communion with the church. It's not just me and Jesus are just swell because he is not, he has a body. It's called the church. And uh, you can't say, look, I, I love the head of the body, but I hate the body. Well, that's weird, you know. Um, so, you know, it's like you go up to a, a woman and say, if a man goes up to a woman, I love your face, but I hate your body, you know. Or let's just say if you think of the church as the bride of Christ and you go to Jesus and say, I love you, but I hate your bride. You, know, you can't, no can do. No can do, you see. So what we want to do is to see that the church needs to be do a better job today of being self-correcting. And some people demand that the bishops will condemn politicians who are openly dissenting from the teachings of the church. And maybe, well, they should, but I think that the better way to handle it 
is for the bishops to do a complete teaching on Holy Communion and what's necessary for the re the worthy reception of Holy Communion, that we be in a state of grace, free from, free from uh, uh, mortal sin, and that we be in communion with the teachings of the church, see? Um, so I think these would be um, some just examples today. We're, we're in real trouble because we've gone on and on for some 50 to 60 years with very little correction ever being issued inside the church. Very few priests have been disciplined, only some. Very few bishops. Um, we also see that many lay faithful who take prominent positions often openly dissent from the teachings and there's no there's no rebuke, no, uh, no answer from the church. Um, so I, again, these things confuse the faithful and they, they bring about, um, I think, a false sense of um, security for people who will one day have to face judgment, see. So um, I, I think I'm gonna you know, kind of begin to wrap up here. It's getting you know, past, well past nine. We finished the chapter, but I know this is this, this thing here at the end is a little bit controversial, but I want you to at least see where, when it's up and running properly, what, what the church being self-correcting looks like. What happens though, interestingly enough, when we don't do the self-correction? Well, the world does it. It's pretty sad, isn't it, that our bishops wouldn't correct priests, except when they were threatened with huge lawsuits. They wouldn't change their policies. It took really worldly, earthly bishops to so devastate the finances and other things of the church that the bishops simply had to do what they should have been doing all along. And that's a very sad situation. It's not new though in the church. You might think of go back to Pharaoh who had to tell Abraham, you had no business putting your wife in my harem. He pimped his wife out because he was scared they'd kill him uh, because she was very beautiful so they could have her. So he just pimped her out, put her in Pharaoh's harem. That's a terrible, immoral thing to do. And it took Pharaoh to call, to call Abraham and say, you had no business doing that. Your God could have killed us both. Now you go back to where you belong, to the Holy Land, where God called you to be. So it took Pharaoh to do that, see? For our hero Abraham, right? The, the great paragon of faith. So this isn't new, it's a human problem. But I regret deeply that it took worldly bishops, I mean, uh, worldly and I mean worldly, not necessarily in the negative sense, but judges and, and, and attorneys generals of some of these states to just so overwhelm the church with legal threat that they had to finally do what was right. That should not have needed to have happened. We should have been on this decades ago and really rooted this problem out. So that's what happens, see. When the church will not correct herself, we will have to be corrected by the world, and that's pretty awful, and that's pretty embarrassing, because we're supposed to be a light to the world, see, and so this is where we are. So here we have a very beautiful and helpful story of Priscilla and Aquila uh, correcting Apollo, who's a good man, but he was in some error, and they corrected him, and then he became even a greater preacher, and was able to help spread the faith, and so that's a good outcome, and that's what we always look for when we correct error. We're not just looking to punish people or yell at them or embarrass them, but we're trying to come to a good outcome so that the gospel is effectively preached. Okay, so comments or questions, rebuttals? Because um, <laughs> that last part's a little controversial, I know, um, but it, uh, well, welcome to the world. Okay. So this is sort of a controversial question, Monsignor. Mm -hmm. um, what about a bishop who gives communion to a politician who openly mm -hmm. uh, says things that are against Catholic teaching? Yeah, and that happens all the time, right? And a lot of bishops tell their priests that they're going to go, you darn well better give them communion. I don't want anyone being denied communion. So this is a current problem in the church. And um, you see that even the bishops don't entirely agree, right? Now, I would say that... Um, um, it's clear from canon law what should be done, that, that, that people who are in open violation, even after having been corrected, remain in open violation of church teaching should not be given communion. That's not just politicians, that's anybody. Um, and what makes it even worse with the politicians is it's well known, usually, where they stand. And so this, this creates even additional scandal, see? So what should happen to them? Well, I think in this case, obviously, it's going to have to be brother bishops who correct them and or the Pope. But unfortunately, we start to see that there's a lot of uh, sort of blasé kind of attitudes. That's why I think that if the bishops wanted to really get together, 
that the best solution would be to, to give an overall teaching. Because it's not just a question, say, abortion. It could be a question of, you know, any number of other, you know, important issues. Um, and to help Catholics to understand what it means to receive worthy communion. And having done that across the board for everybody, including you and me, then they could start, I think, enforcing Canon 915, which is the canon I was quoting earlier that indicates that if a person is in manifest grave and ongoing descent, they, shed, they, they should not be offered Holy Communion. The question is, um, you know, <clears throat> a lot of bishops just don't want to engage that with politicians because people will simply politicize it and they won't get the real message. So if we're going to do to politicians, what about doctors, lawyers, nurses, the average Catholic, you see? So I think the way back is to give a comprehensive teaching. But even then, getting the bishops to agree on that comprehensive teaching is going to be a bit of a stretch right now because the bishops conference is very divided I hate to say even on matters like this do you think um, I mean I've been actually giving this a lot of thought and talking with amongst my some of my friends um, mm -hmm. because the church is you know obviously it's also part of it is an earthly enterprise and we do have the 501c3 tax exemption status mm -hmm. hypothetically speaking obviously it's detrimental to the church in the materialistic realm if we were to forgo the tax exemption status if we lost that or freely give it up, it would give the church more of the spiritual freedom that would otherwise, you know, like other, you know, the material part would be gone holding down the bishops who are now just pretty much CEOs running corporations. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that um, uh, threats against the, the uh, tax exempt status of the church have never been very serious because of the First Amendment. Uh, to free, you know, to free, you know, free religion. Um, it's, it's, so it's a pretty um, dead on arrival that they could just simply cancel it for just the Catholic Church, for example. They'd have to cancel it for all the churches, all the synagogues, all the mosques. Uh, so I, I think right now the threat of that is is not great. Uh, it's sometimes threatened. Uh, for example, if a a minister, Protestant or Catholic, gets up and does clear politicking where he says, everybody vote for so-and-so, uh, that, that that church could lose its tax income status, but there's never been a successful case, case of it. I think it's terribly wrong for a priest or a minister to get up and do that. Um, I think we should preach principles rather than parties or, um, or, or um, uh, candidates. But, um, but I would say that um, I don't think that's a, a huge threat right now, just given the First Amendment. Um, and right now, the Supreme Court is in no mood with its current membership to entertain lots of um, things that attack the First Amendment, which is the right to uh, you know, religious liberty, you know, and also a free press. And, you know. But would it be easier for the, you know, the church leadership just to like do what it needs to do? Because certain religious organizations like monasteries and convents that do provide health care, the ones that don't take government subsidies, that they don't take Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, they're more able to practice with um, truer to the church teachings, right? And those religious orders are able to not be forced to euthanize their patients versus the ones that take um, Medicaid or Medicare, Mm -hmm. are under a lot of stress. Yeah, right. I think you're right about that. And again, we, we have to continue to fight these on the grounds of religious liberty. But there have been some, you know, losses. For example, we even been decertified from doing adoptions. Catholic charities can no longer do adoptions because we don't favor, or because we favor married heterosexual couples over either single mothers, single fathers, or gay couples. And so they, they told us we can no longer do adoptions um, in the city of Washington. So we have lost some of these things. Um, we can do private adoptions, but we cannot, we can't, we're not, we're no longer certified uh, to, you know, to do. And we were the best in the business. It was ultimately the kids that have been hurt. Uh, so we, they can get to us. Um, but I would say that um, I don't think the tax exempt status is greatly threatened. Although I just as soon be free of it, like you said earlier, than to be, have anyone, you know, try to hold it over us to make us not say certain things or to say certain things. Um, so, but our bishops, you're right, have become, they, they, they sort of um, resemble more CEOs really more than bishops now. It's just kind of the nature of the modern church and what's happened. And maybe this is one of the reasons why the Lord is humbling us. I mean, we're in serious trouble now. I mean, 
with financially a lot of our dioceses are going bankrupt bankrupt and then you add to that the coronavirus and that only a third of people have come back to mass so far and i understand that not everybody can can come back now but i don't think we'll ever have the numbers we had before this um we're, we're going to probably have to see a lot of parishes closed and a lot of schools a lot of our institutions mm -hmm. are going to be going away in the next couple of years unless people suddenly decide to return but I don't think I don't think we're going to get anything close to what we had before this uh, the shutdowns, and um, I'm I'm concerned for that. But on the other hand, maybe we're too big for our britches. Maybe we need this humility, you know, humility, and um, to be a little smaller and a little more vigorous, um, to be less corporate in our thinking. Uh, right now, they've had to lay off about 35 people at the pastoral center. Uh, most parishes, including our own, we've had to furlough certain employees. Um, it's getting real now. It's getting real. And again, I think that um, I'm not blaming people who haven't come back because I don't know why they haven't come back. It's not about that. But the simple reality is that the numbers are looking very, very bad. And it doesn't look like there's going to be any big return anytime soon. And with, you know, some people are still sending in their contributions. That helps, of course. But it is a very serious um, blow. So, it's really more things like that, maybe from the Lord's own hand, you know, that um, we're having to reassess, you know, maybe we were too big for our britches. We bishops shouldn't be like CEOs. Maybe it's going to have to get smaller uh, before it gets bigger, but it's going to be, it's going to mean a lot of hard heartache where we see churches closed. We see schools closed. We see hospitals closing. You know, we, we see Catholic charities folding. We see things like that just going away because we just can't do it anymore. There's just not enough people. Who are coming to church and contributing so and we'll I see how it all pans that. out i don't want to be too um but we have to i think be sober you know yeah and also catholic schools um may have problems in the future too i don't see how the teachers are able to find faithful catholic teachers to teach just for the numbers and then given the recent supreme court ruling i don't see how they can enforce you know teachers for, you know like coming yeah. in and teaching heresy. There's just no way and practicing unfaithful lives. That's. Yeah. So that's we'll see how all work. this, you know, pans out as the years go by, but I, I think we're going to be, um, let's put it this way. We're going to have to be doing a lot of rebuilding in the, in the weeks and months or the months and years ahead. Um, because I think that um, we used to have 600 people coming to mass here. We had 120 last weekend and I think we'll build up from there some, but I don't know if we'll ever have 600 anytime soon. And again, I, please understand, I'm, I'm not saying that there are not some people right now who should not be coming to any public gathering, you know, because they're vulnerable. But I'm thinking a little further down the road and um, even dioceses that have been open longer than ours are kind of stuck at that same number. About a third of the people have come back and it's pretty much stopped. There aren't many new people coming back. So we'll have to see and when maybe we get a vaccine and people feel safer again. But I still think we're going to struggle to get back to, any, to anything close to the numbers we had. And they were already pretty low. Now, a final thought on this, because I don't want to sound like Mr. Doomsday. You know, the Lord is still on the throne and the church will still be here. But we may be smaller and we may, you know, as you may know, also already in New York, they closed almost 20 of their Catholic schools. And um, we've closed at least one. We've got several more on the chopping block now that probably won't make it through this uh, if there's another shutdown. Um, so we're going to have to be, um, I think, very humble in the years to come, humble, and continue to try to be um, as evangelical as we can, and to call people home with love and respect. And people need to right now, I think, make prudential decisions. They, they, there are some who should not be coming out. Maybe some are, could come out themselves, but they're taking care. They have elderly people living with them. There, I understand all of that, so I want to re respect people's prudential judgments and say, now is not the time for us to say we, we, got, we know what's going to happen, but it's going to be a lot more rebuilding. We were very discouraged at the numbers who came back. Um, people are scared. And um, uh, so, you know, all of, that, all of that's factors, you know, and some of you may not feel ready to go back to church. So as I say, all of us have prudential decisions to make. And our, our situations are all different and unique. And um, we're not all young and strong. Some of us, like I found out about myself, I'm getting older, you know, and I can't beat off things anymore like I used to. And um, I was in the hospital for 11 days. So, you know, 
we all have decisions to make based on our circumstances. But um, it is going to be a long, long time of rebuilding right now. That's everybody agrees on that. Okay. There was certainly no line at the door the first Sunday that we reopened or anywhere in the anywhere in the country. There was never a line at the door. We never maxed out. We never had to say, too bad we've hit our limit. You have to come to the next match. It just it hasn't happened anywhere. <laughs> so all right. I mean you might find an individual parish here or there, but that's just not what's that's just not what's happening. So we have these signs. Sorry, the church is full. Please come to the next mass. We've never had to put them out. <laughs> I said, I'm almost embarrassed. I see them sitting there in the sacristy. <laughs> it's like, what were we thinking? Okay, well, listen, I don't mean to sound so ominous. This is terrible. Again, the Lord is on the throne. It will be, somehow it will be all right. But I think that we do have to accept that maybe he's also teaching us something. We haven't been self-correcting. We haven't really been doing the essential things. And Sometimes if we don't correct ourselves, the Lord has to let others come and correct us. Maybe it's a pandemic. Maybe it's a, uh, you know, a, an earthly judge, um, or, uh, attorney general, who, you know, sues the church. So you see, um, this is why going back to our, our, our text that being self-correcting is very, very important for us. And um, if we don't do enough of it, the Lord will eventually bring it to us because he will not let his church continue to go on. Uh, in a wrong direction, or with wrong emphasis, or uh, with sin, and uh, with people winking at sin and making light of it, and misteaching people, uh, the Lord will eventually act. And uh, I'm not saying I'm enough of a prophet to say this plague is that, because the whole world, you know, secular, pagan, Catholic, Buddhist, everyone's been affected. So I'm not prepared to say that this is a particular punishment for the church that's sent by the Lord but rather maybe just for the whole world. But even there, I'm not, I'm not prepared to say this is of the Lord. It's sometimes these things just happen in paradise lost. So, all right. Well, my goodness. That's deep. I've been talking an awful lot. And really my opinion is, in much of this is just my opinion. I mean, the numbers are what they are, uh, but please take it for that. It's just my opinion and um, I could be uh, could be wrong in any detail, um, but I I know what the numbers are, and so it, I do know that it's going to be. We're not just going to suddenly uh, let's say a vaccine is announced tomorrow, and people say we're not going to just suddenly have our everything filled. It's just it's going to take a long time, and we will have lost a lot. Not just churches, but restaurants, theaters, um, lots of places that really depended on and have been closed down now for five over five months. What's happening now? <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of things in the window never, have been taken out. Yeah, they'll never come back. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that we're facing right now, and I think that at times, um, someone somewhere pressed a reset button. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm glad to hear you got a good uh, clientele all lined up there at the eye doctor. <laughs> Why don't you set up your eye doctor appointments here, and I'll have a full church or something like that. How about that? <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. At any rate. But, uh, but I mean, and again, please understand, I'm, I'm not, I understand it's not time for everybody to come back. So, yeah. All right. Well, we'll end here uh, with a prayer. All right. Um, Lord, you are still on the throne. And um, I, I, as a pastor, I need to trust you uh, for my own parish. Um, I also know that, um, um, I also know that I need to trust you for, um, my own health and for the health and well-being of everyone. And um, we do ask for a cure, Lord. Uh, we ask for a vaccine of some kind. We ask also, Lord, for um, um, greater, uh, we ask for great patience with one another uh, as we all make uh, our decisions. Some of us are anxious to get back to work. Some of us know we need to stay home. Help us to be patient with each other. Um, we also ask, Lord, that we can see in the church a greater move toward uh, purity and self-correction so that the world doesn't have to come and issue these corrections, which is embarrassing for us, and it should be. So we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, listen, bless you all. Thanks for listening to me go on and on there at the end, but um, bless your hearts. And we'll, Oh, by the way, next Monday's Labor Day, so we'll just, you know, cancel, okay? And because um, I, I find there's some Monday holidays where we can still meet, like, you know, Columbus Day or uh, Veterans Day or whatever. But uh, if a holiday falls on, on those days, but 
these, you know, Labor Day is a day that pretty much everybody really does take off. So I think we'll, uh, we'll just call next Monday off, okay? And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. And I'll try to help get the word out, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Monsignor. Thanks, Monsignor. Bye. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.